Hello everybody, my name is Joshua Boniface, and I'm the author of PBC, or Parallel Virtual Cluster. This is the first in a series of videos on PBC, and in this video we're going to cover the project description, a brief history of the PBC project, the motivations for creating it, as well as some basic definitions and concepts that will be used in this and future videos. So part one is the description of the project. The tagline is, PBC is a Linux KVM-based hyperconverged infrastructure virtualization cluster solution that is fully free software, scalable, redundant, self-healing, self-managing, and designed for administrator simplicity. So let's take that whole massive sentence apart and discuss what each part of it means. First, it's a Linux KVM-based virtualization cluster. So PVC is a hypervisor system, and for anyone who knows about virtualization, you should know what that word means, but if you don't, what that is is a tool that's able to take some set of physical servers and run isolated and independent virtual machines on top of them. And virtual machine is exactly what it sounds like. It's like a virtual computer running on top of that hardware. What that does is means you can have multiple virtual machines running on one physical machine that are able to share the resources of that physical machine and allow you to run more isolated services and isolated guest operating systems on top of a single piece of hardware. PVC is based on the Linux KVM system, which is a Type 2 hypervisor built into the Linux kernel, and it's one of the most flexible options. It's capable of running many guest operating systems with very high performance and high compatibility. So KVM can run basically any operating system you can throw at it. And PVC is clustered. And what that means is it makes use of several discrete physical servers to provide a single holistic view of all its component systems that all work together. So in effect, you give it a set of physical servers and it runs a set of virtual machines and it abstracts those virtual machines and the other resources away from the physical hardware itself. PVC is a hyperconverged infrastructure or HCI solution. So traditionally, and I mean, you know, going back at least a decade or two in the system administration space, your storage and your compute in a server cluster or a system were discrete. So you'd have your storage, which might be on a storage area network or a SAN or on a network attached storage device, a NAS. You know, you'd have your storage on one hand and your compute, so what would actually run the virtual servers, on the other hand. And they'd be separate on separate pieces of hardware. Hyperconverged just means instead that the compute and storage are co-located onto the same physical servers. And this tends to reduce complexity and sprawl. You only need one set of servers in order to provide both your storage and your compute. There are some trade-offs to this, but with modern high-performance hardware, generally it's not that big of a deal and the benefits outweigh the complexity. So PBC makes use of this design paradigm. It's able to provide virtual compute and virtual storage infrastructure to VMs on one set of servers. And finally, just because this word had nowhere else to really go, PBC is a full solution, meaning that all the parts that are needed to make this design a reality are part of the system. So it provides you the entire system as a term I'll use later, it's batteries included. PBC is fully free software. So, PVC consists of several parts, and it includes many other tools that are separate projects in their own right, but the parts that make it PVC are all free and open source software. All the other parts are too, but not necessarily under the same license. So, all the PVC components are written in Python 3, and they're licensed under the GNU General Public License, or GPL, version 3. At this time, I am strict with version 3. I don't provide a later version option. That may change in the future, but at the moment I'm still apprehensive about the future of the uh, Free Software Foundation, so I don't want to give them carte blanche to change the license on me. And all of the code, the setup and management playbooks, which use Ansible, and all the surrounding tools are available on GitHub at the address on screen now. So if you want, you can look at the entire code base of the PPC project, inspect it, and change it if you want. PVC is scalable. So PVC has a minimum number of servers needed to form a cluster, but it has no theoretical maximum. It's able to support either a three or five coordinator system, and what coordinator means I'll get to later, with an arbitrary number of non-coordinator or hypervisor only servers. So in practice, it should be able to scale from the minimum of three servers up to at least 
12 or possibly more. This provides ample opportunity to grow a cluster as your needs change or as more resources are required. I probably wouldn't go above 12 servers myself, and I've never tested more than 3. So this is all hypothetical, but I'd welcome someone testing such a large cluster, and I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. So I call it scalable. PVC is redundant. PVC is designed from the ground up to be redundant at the host level. And this was something that was a very key design goal in the project, as I'll get to later. The key design motivation was, to quote, the loss of one server for any reason, be it maintenance or a failure or anything, must not require complex actions by the administrator, must not cripple the cluster, and must not cause VM downtime, at least within reason. So, with the design, a PVC cluster can seamlessly tolerate at least one server being offline, with the minimum three-server design, and larger designs, can, if they're configured correctly, seamlessly tolerate up to two servers being offline. And this allows you to, you know, do things like perform maintenance or handle hardware failures without it seriously impacting all of your systems running on the cluster. PVC is self-healing and self-managing. And these two are kind of tied together. So a PBC cluster is able to intelligently respond within reason. It's not an quote-unquote AI tool or anything like that. But it is able to generally intelligently respond to events and handle them without administrator intervention. So the three main cases where that's true are failing crashing VMs are automatically restarted. And this happens in a very short interval. So if your VM were to die, it will start it back up if it's supposed to be running. Failing crashing servers are automatically fenced assuming they're configured to support this, and the VMs are migrated to other still functional servers. And lastly, failing VM data disks have the data moved to other disks. And this is actually a feature of Ceph, which is the storage subsystem, and it's where I get those two words, self-healing and self-managing, from. So in addition to, you know, the actual virtual machines being self-healing and self-managing, the storage backend is self-healing and self-managing. And lastly, PVC is designed for administrator simplicity. It's designed to work how you would expect, out of the box, without any complex tinkering. And what I mean by how you would expect is that, you know, if you tell it to do something, it will do that thing. It doesn't require you to put a lot of thought into, for instance, how do I take down a node and move all its VMs away? It has a command to handle that. And that was one of the design goals as well, to just let you simplify running a virtual cluster in a way that doesn't require you to come up with your own ways of doing things, your own scripts or anything like that. The administrative interfaces are well documented, so there's a full API specification, as well as a self-documenting CLI client, and the CLI client uses the API. So the API is fully featured and the CLI is fully featured. The CLI does offer some additional functionality that is able to leverage, you know, making multiple API calls. But for the most part, you know, anything you can do with the CLI, you can do with the API. As well, the CLI client does provide extensive scripting capability. It has, you know, the options to output data in JSON format for programmability and such. So if you do want to write your own scripts around the administrator interface, you can. Now at this time, and this may be controversial, there is no web UI for the system. It is a planned feature. It's something I've wanted to implement, but it's not a priority. And I kind of, you know, self-justify that by saying a CLI is simpler. And again, it might be a controversial statement, but, you know, as someone who spends all his days in a CLI, I think a CLI is simpler. And the main reason for this is simply that I'm not a front-end developer. I'm not good at it. It's not something I've excelled in or had the patience to learn. So it's not something that's been done yet. I, of course, would welcome a contribution of such a web UI. And as I said before, the API is fully documented and it's complete, so it would be possible to write one if someone wanted to. So all of these descriptors basically add up to one thing. It's a system that puts the administrator in control of managing their cluster, but doesn't demand extensive time or knowledge after setting it up. It's batteries included in many areas, so the implementation details of a lot of the backend operations of the cluster are just abstracted away from the administrator and it makes a lot of opinionated software choices and by that i mean you know you don't have a lot of options for reconfiguring how the backend works and this is by design so that you get a complete package and the full functionality without choice paralysis you don't have to worry about what is going to store your data in the backend that is chosen for you by the project by the software and you just give it the resources it requires and it does the thing it does and gives you this nice simple interface on top. So part two, a brief history. 
So, PBC has been something that I've been working on for over five years at this point, and I've kind of kept it under the radar. I haven't, you know, made a public post about it anywhere, and this is really the first in-depth explanation that I'm posting to some sort of social media platform. So, PBC really begins all the way back in 2013, and between 2013 and 2018, I was experimenting with a lot of virtualization solutions, which I cover in the next section. After finding all of those lacking, in May 2018, I started the initial development work of PBC, and by June, I had most of the core components for the virtualization part of it completed. And thus, by July 2018, uh, it was my home lab's hypervisor system. It became self-hosting for me. Between 2018 and 2019, I continued working on some of the additional features, the quote-unquote batteries included parts, which was the storage, networking, and provisioning functionality. And I also, during that time, pitched it to my employer, which is an MSP provider, and they accepted it as a solution for us because we had very similar needs for a hypervisor solution to replace our aging one. So May 2020, we had our first production deployment through my employer. And between 2020 and 2023, I continued incremental development, bug fixes, and enhancements, slowly but surely bringing the system ready for public availability, I'll say, since it was already in production. And by today, so October 2023, we have 16 production clusters, including my own, and we're very rapidly approaching what I'd consider a valid 1.0 release with stable functionality. It's not quite there yet, but probably in the next year or so, it will hit that milestone, and that is kind of the place I want it to be. So part three, the motivations behind PVC. And big disclaimer warning, all of this section is my personal opinion. You may disagree with it, and that's fine. So PVC, as I mentioned before, grew out of my experiments with virtualization in a home lab slash home production environment. What I mean by home production is that, you know, in my home lab, I run a lot of services that I depend on and other people, both my family and my friends, depend on on a day-to-day -day basis. So to me, my cluster being down for four hours because I want to mess with some hardware changes is not valid. Um, I can't have my cluster down for four hours because then no one would be able to use it. So that really drove a lot of my opinions when making PVC. So as I say here, I had a desire for a redundant clustered solution, the virtual machine management that would generally stay out of my way and not break constantly, keeping my critical VMs up and running even through hardware maintenance. So during that time, that five-year gap, I investigated several options, but I found them all very seriously lacking. So the first one is Coral Sync and Pacemaker. So these are my first real attempt at a clustered solution for KVM VM management that wasn't its own tool. Both of these are pretty standard Linux utilities for doing high availability, and they only need two servers, and I was trying to do two servers, but ultimately this solution crashed and burned hard. Um, VMs would constantly die due to bugs in CoroSync, and there were a lot of those. Even though it was a mature project, it seemed to have a crap ton of bugs. Restarting the services would bring down all the VMs. They wouldn't stay running independently of the service, which was a big problem. And it offered no storage and network management. All that I was still on my own for. So ultimately, I did run the solution for well over a year, actually. But it was just a major headache. And having been running this, it was a driver to make PVC what it was. Another project I looked at around this time was Gennetti, which I say, okay, it was Google's pre-Borg and pre-Kubernetes VM tool back, it, back in the mid-2000s. Like, it's actually a very old project. I found it in a web search for an HCI solution, you know, just stumbled across it. I think a friend mentioned it, too. And it looked really nice, and it actually gave me a lot of inspiration for how PVC worked. But... At the time, the project was just dead, it was unmaintained, and it lacked a lot of modern features. For instance, at the time, the only storage backend was LVM on a particular VM. Again, it was missing some modern functionality that was really needed. Apparently, and I checked back into it recently, it's actually found new life. If the GitHub contributions are any indication, it seems to actually have a big community behind it now, which it didn't in 2018. But since I use PVC these days, and I've spent five years developing PVC, I haven't really revisited it as my solution fits me perfectly. Now by this point you're probably thinking why not Proxmox VE? It is the thing everyone always uses. Every home labber uses it. I don't like it. I attempted to use it at least three times. I tried it in 2013, I tried it in 2015, and again in 2018 just to see if it had gotten better. It didn't. At least then. At the time 
it lacked features I considered absolutely critical. Um, it didn't have proper shared storage at the time. It didn't have proper inter-server failover. And I really didn't like the performance I got out of it when I tried it. It just performed terribly, and VM moves between nodes took forever, naturally, because it didn't have shared storage. It also ran a very old kernel that was well past its prime, which hinted at the deeper issues that were revealed to me as I looked at its code and design. It was just not elegant. Way too much PHP in there, guys. And bugs come from inelegance. And looking at their bug tracker, I noticed a lot of bugs. All in all, I found it to just suffer from poor timing. It arrived way too soon, you know, in the mid-2000s to embrace modern design and tools from the start. So, as it adapted to changing norms, it did so by basically bolting on all these new features in a way that really gave me pause. And for anyone who's been frustrated by it, it really paralleled PFSense to me in that regard. It's just tried to do too much, it didn't have a good architecture behind it, and as a result, every time I looked at it, I went, I don't really want to trust my infrastructure to this tool. Is it better today? I mean, probably. It's had another five years to develop, and from, you know, what I hear in all the online communities that I'm a part of, it's still the number one recommended solution. But I also see it as having different goals from PVC. Proxmox is really designed to be a ultra-simple-to-use virtualization solution with its nice web UI and all these hundreds of features that let you do anything you want with it. But it's designed primarily for just a single server, and if you have multiple servers, it really doesn't treat them as a proper cluster. So I consider it just to have different goals. I'm not competing with Proxmox, and I don't expect anyone who uses Proxmox to necessarily think of PVC as an alternative. But it's one of those things where this is the most popular tool out there for this, so it's ultimately going to be a comparison. Next up, I looked into OpenStack, CloudStack, and the various, as I call them, other stacks. I'm sure there's probably, you know, half a dozen of these at this point. And the problem here was all of these are big, sprawling projects with dozens of interdependent, but also independent components. And what that causes is just massive choice paralysis. You know, do I choose component A or component B when I'm setting up my cluster? And what component you pick at some level affects a different component. And just generally, it makes it a very complex system and very hard to really put together. It's also got massive hardware requirements, and there's some parts that can't run on the same server as other parts. I did experience OpenStack tried to deploy an OpenStack cluster and I found that, you know, I needed five servers at a bare minimum and even that didn't give me proper redundancy. So just in general, I found it to be a massive over complex solution for pretty much anything I'd do with it and anything I'd do with it at my employer. It also suffers a lot from the vendorware trap. Too many companies want to sell you a solution based on one of these stacks and that, you know, just sours me to it completely. They may be open source, but with, you know, a dozen vendors all trying to get their own pet feature integrated into the solution, you know, it just contributes more to that complexity and that choice paralysis. And because of all of that, it's not really suitable for a small system. If you're building a giant public cloud, sure, but not a home lab or a small MSP system, you know, OpenStack just was not the tool for that, and I pretty much just disregarded it after that. It fits a completely different niche, and PBC is designed to kind of be at a lower level than these solutions. Lastly, there's the proprietary solutions. VMware, of course, had and has massive market share. I did run it before 2013. I, I never really liked it. And of course, it's proprietary, so it forces you into their ecosystem, their management tools. They want to charge you money for it. It is what it is as a proprietary solution. Similarly, Nutanix looked amazing, and I got to play with it for a very brief amount of time once, and I liked what I saw, but it costs a full arm and both your legs to run it. And we're talking licensing costs per node that are more than the cost of the physical server hardware. And there's no free option like even VMware has. And in my professional experience, I have seen it deployed in action at customers without that full investment, and it's paltry for what you pay. It's terrible unless you pay the ultra high-end cost for everything, and at that point, you might as well find anything else. <laughs> but it does have a nice UI. I'll give it that. There are others in this space, but honestly, I never seriously looked at them. Because definitely by 2018, and even before that, I was a major floss evangelist, and I really demanded an open source solution for myself. So in short, in early 2018, there was actually nothing out there that fit my use case. Um, it needed to be free software. It needed to have host level redundancy. It needed to have a shared storage backend, so I'm not moving multi-gigabyte disks between hosts. And it needed a modern kernel and hardware support. So with nothing in that space, I decided to try my hand at building my own. Armed only with enough Python knowledge to be dangerous. And somehow, it worked out. 
I mean, obviously, I'm still not a professional programmer. I'm a system administrator by day, but I've been happy with it. It's been running in production for over three years, and it works. Part four. And this is the last section of this video, and for this, I'm just going to define a few terms and concepts that will be important in the future videos in this series. I will use all of these words frequently later, so here is what they mean. The first is a node. So in PBC land, we call a physical server running the PBC software a node, and that's a consistent term. So when we speak of nodes, we're talking of the physical servers running the PBC software. A set of nodes makes a cluster, and a PBC cluster is the unified holistic set of nodes on which the VMs run. You look at PBC not as a set of hypervisors, you look at it as a unified cluster, and it just happens to have these sub definitions inside of it, which are the physical notes. Next term is a VM, a virtual machine, an isolated guest operating system. Of course, I will use the term VM, the acronym for it, rather than virtual machine throughout. So that's what that means. Next is OSD. Now we're into kind of storage terms. This is borrowed from Ceph, and an OSD in Ceph is the storage disk and its management process. And since PBC makes extensive use of the Ceph storage system, which I will cover in a future video, I use the term OSD for PBC as well. Similarly, on top of OSDs, you have pools, which is the storage abstraction that exists between the OSDs and the volumes. And volumes, of course, are the virtual disks, and they use the CephRBD system that are actually used for VM storage. So in a VM, you have a volume defining, you know, say it's primary disk. That volume is stored on a pool, which has specific configuration options to it, you know, setting like, for instance, the replication levels. And then the pool actually stores its data on these OSDs which are distributed amongst the nodes. The last term is the term coordinator, which is used a lot within PVC. So what the coordinators are, they're a specific subset of the PVC nodes that are effectively the brains of the cluster. There's either going to be three or five of these in a cluster, no other number, and the reasons for that we'll get into in a future video. And all nodes that aren't coordinators simply run VMs. So as I said earlier on when I was talking about the redundancy, the minimum size of a PVC cluster is three nodes. So if you have a three node cluster, they're all coordinators. If you then wanted to add a fourth node, you'd add it as a non-coordinator. Okay, that wraps up this video. Um, hopefully this gives you the very basic knowledge you need in order to understand the future videos in this series. These will be coming out at random intervals um, whenever I have time to make them. So I'd appreciate it if you subscribe to my channel here. And as time goes on, you know, I'll dive further into setting up a PVC cluster, how to run it, as well as discussing in more detail how it works. So again, thank you for watching and have yourself a great day.